Okay, we have all of the beads for the tail flail set out and ready to go. The B beads, which will be most of the flail, and then the A's, C's, and H's for the tips. If you're following along with the PDF, we're on part three, step 24, and we're doing row one of the dragon tail flail. And to start, you're gonna pick up four B beads, that's the cylinders, in order to get the first row of brick stitch started. On the tutorial, I also have um, arrows that kind of show the path of the thread while you're going. And I'll do my best here to show you where we have attached start. So I just went between the four beads with my thread and I'm gonna draw the new ones all the way down so that they settle in a two by two grouping beside each other. And I'm gonna go back through the last two beads on the thread. And that has attached two thirds of row one onto the tail tip. The next column is going to be another two B beads. You're gonna go under the same spot as before. So between the four beads on the tail tip and then draw your thread all the way through so that they settle in a column besides those first two columns when you go back through them. So row one is two beads stacked on top of each other in three columns like that. We're going to increase in row two. So you're picking up four beads to get it started. One, two, three, and four. And you're going to go through the closest space that you have where you ended and back through the last two beads that you picked up to secure it there. I'm working at a very strange angle, so I'll go through one and go through next after. Go through one, go through the second. Make sure they settle next to each other in a two by two group. And for the third column, pick up two, only two. You only pick up four for the first cluster in a row. You go through the next space available and then back through the two beads again. And because we are doing an increase, we're going to pick up two one more time and go through the same space we just went through last time. Brick stitch is a lot easier to understand if you um, if you Google some tutorials that break it down for you, probably a bit better than what I'm doing. But there's also ones where they're uh, digital simulations and you don't have fingers in the way that can show you the path that a thread takes as it loops through the last row in order to attach the current row on top of it. At the end of row two, you will have two beads stacked up on top of two beads stacked up, so four beads total, but you'll have four columns instead of three. Now we're gonna increase that to five columns in row three. And don't be afraid to pause this video and rewind this video and try to watch the micro maneuvers that I'm making. I am going as slowly as I can To accommodate that. So that's the first four on there to start the new row. We're picking up two for the middle column. And you go through the space between the second and third column to secure it. It's a lot harder, I find, to uh, do these steps on camera than when I'm on my own just holding it in front of my nose. So pardon my clumsiness if my fingers are getting in the way. This last, sorry, second last column goes between the last two in row two.
And then for the fifth column, you're going to go through that same space one more time. And you get that very satisfying brick effect as these rows build up. So you'll now have six beads stacked up on top of each other. So three rows of two, and this will be five columns now, but we need six because there are three tips on this tail, which means we need six columns of beads to attach them to. Row four and the final row, you pick up your four B beads, do, 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 do. go through the closest space that bridged Wow, close the space and attach it to that bridge of thread there. Words are hard. Go back through the last two beads added. Remember to keep pulling your thread taunt, but you don't want to break it. So be careful, pay attention to your tension. Picking up two again, going through the next available space between the columns there. back through them again. That's half of them now added. What have we got? Three more groups of two to put on here. Go back again. Pick up the fifth group. And the last group of two goes into the same place as that fifth group did at the end of row three. There you go, that is the paddle all done. And the tips themselves, we're going to use the fringe technique for that. So we've made it to step 34. Three on the tail tips. We're going to pick up three B beads. One, two, three. And a C bead. Then an H. And then an A. And let them slide all the way down to the base. They're all there, neatly lined up. You're going to skip that A bead because that's going to anchor everything onto your paddle and go through the H and C. Draw them taunt and pick up three size Bs and thread your needle through those B beads in your last row and back out again through the B beads beside it. Right there. I try to um, also draw arrows of where the thread goes for these as well in the tutorial. So if the video is too all over the place, I keep drifting off screen or something, just go back and look at the pictures, follow the arrows. The middle tail tip, we're going to put four B beads on here. Double checking my math. Yeah, four B beads and then a C, an H, and an A. So that's four. One, one, and one. Let them travel all the way down to the base of the thread before you skip that A bead and go through the H and C only. And you pick up four B beads. Go through column number four. Ooh, I had a bead stuck to me. And then come out again through column number five beside it for that last tail tip. And we're gonna pick up three B beads again. C, H, and A. 
all the way to the bottom of the thread, skip the A, go through the H and C, and pick up your last three B beads of this project. This time, instead of you know turning around to come back to add another tail tip, you're actually going to run your thread all the way to the base of the tail tip and pull that thread taunt. I've mentioned this in other tutorials, but I do like to roll the cylinders around just to get them settled next to each other nicely, side by side. And at this point, you might notice this flail is not the most stable of objects because it's really only hanging on by one thread at the tip of your tail. So here's where I was talking about you can adjust which way you want your flail to face as you stabilize its attachment by going through beads on the tail tip and the first row of beads in the tail flail itself. So just weaving back and forth however you feel works best for your project until you don't have it waving around any more than you like it to be. You might need to flex your flail carefully in order to run your needle through the beads. Just be careful in your manipulations because you don't want to loosen your Nymo thread or snag it on other spikes. But the, uh, the more times you go back and forth between the tail tip and that first row of bee beads, the more stable this join will be. Then if you accidentally you know, catch it on something or it flexes strangely, it's not just going to pop off the tip of the tail. Don't ask me how I know this. It's not the story I like to tell. As I have a twisted knot. Another reason to let your thread unwind every once in a while is you avoid these really bad twists as you draw your threads through other beads. let that just untwist now. You'll know that you have overdone it when you can't pass your needle through your size A bead anymore. Try not to let it get to that point because believe it or not, these beads will break if you put too much thread through them. They are glass after all, they do have a structural flex point. Here we go. I'm pretty happy with that. It's not easy to move or flick around, so I'm quite comfortable just calling it there for the flail and weaving my end in until I'm happy with it being secure before I cut it. And uh, the last thing we got to do, which is optional, you don't have to do this step, is to hang a loop from the top of the dragon. So I'll be back with that step. We're back with the optional loop. Now choosing where to hang your S dragon from is gonna be a personal choice. I say this a lot, I guess. A lot of personal choices happening. I prefer mine to have a straight up and down look to them. So I have my thread about to come out here between the uh, second and third spike of my dragon so that it can hang like this. I just got to get it a bit more off to the side here. I've included a split ring with this, which you can attach now or you can just thread on later on. Just be careful not to break beads or snap the thread. I prefer to add mine after I've made the loop. And again, if you're following the instructions on our S dragon, we are at 
Optional hanging loop row one, step 38 of part three, and you're gonna pick up 15 H beads to make this loop. Um, I prefer to match my loops to the color of the seed beads in the spine so that they have more of a camouflage to them. That's five. But maybe you want it to stand out. Maybe you want it to match the color of your dragon instead. So if you do happen to have enough A beads and you'd rather use A beads instead, go for it. 15 beads is a nice sized loop to get the split ring on it and not just be this massive loop of beads over your dragon, I find. So right now I'm going out one side of my dragon and I want this loop to go over my spine, so I'm going to go just straight through the other side of my dragon, back to where I started. And uh, go through the beads and around basically in a circle. Through the dragon, through the beads, through the dragon, two or three times. I was just mentioning as we finish the tail flail, these beads do have a limit for how many times you can pass your Nymo thread through them. But you also want your Nymo thread to be pretty secure and not, not just be the only thing that your dragon is hanging from. So two or three passes is ideal. If you had enough thread at the end of your dragon and you just wove your thread back to the top of the dragon like I did, then you've only got one end to really worry about. But if you had to start a new thread and you're working with two ends, then you want to work from both ends to go through the loop as well. Did I skip a bead? I think I skipped a bead. Yeah, I skipped a bead. Gotta be careful that that doesn't happen. Make sure you go through every single bead in your loop. Or it looks weird, like mine does. and then you struggle with it, like I am currently doing, to frog it back. There we go. It's just about that integrity of your floss, integrity of the loop. You don't want your dragon to be dangling from a slip of thread. You want it to, you know, be able to withstand, you know, if you accidentally or hang it in a window and brush it with something going by, or you know, you have a kid who likes to pull at shiny things. At least withstand that initial pull until you can stop the force on it. Go through each bead this time. Yes. And it doesn't matter if you double thread or if you're, you know, going through the beads very carefully, not going through your thread. It, it it's all hidden now in the loop. You're not adding anything onto this, you're just making a loop. I also say to um, make a little knot at the bottom of it because that secures your thread, even though you're going to weave it, it makes that loop that much more stable and not going anywhere on your dragon. See, 15 seed beads, just enough to fit in between, stand up above a little bit, blends in nice with the spine, weave in your end however you want to wrap it up. I'm just going to get it out of my way for now and I'll finish it in a moment. I don't mind attaching my split ring at the end because I have these handy dandy split ring openers. People who don't like fighting with split rings because it bites their nails or splits nails and breaks nails, maybe you wanted to put it on there before you closed your loop up. But for me, I just find something satisfying about using the openers to put the ring on there at the end and I can admire it. Okay, let's get rid of this little tail. Do, do, do. We're done with the needle now. 
and I have enough thread to actually use it to hang the dragon from, so. Oh yeah, more than enough thread to make the hanging portion. Go through the loop. I can go through the loop. I can do this. It's because my edges are so frayed. I don't want to try and feed the ends of my thread through. Ta-da! Made it to the end. And we're done with our Infinity Rose S Dragon tutorial and I hope you're as satisfied with your finish as I am with mine. Your rows might move around a little bit depending on how close your knots are. You might be able to turn it this way or turn it that way or leave it in the front. I always advise be careful how much you manipulate the rows because you don't want to cut it off the cord that it's secured from. All that hard work for the rows to pop out. But you know what? I'll put a little thing in here too. If you do notice that your rows could use some tightening or secure, just go up and down through your dragon and uh, and secure it with Nymo. It's not going to hurt. Quite happy with that finish. Look at that twirl. I love the balance. And this doesn't look exactly like the model. No, but it's a handmade craft. It's not going to. Sure looks pretty close though, doesn't it? Oh, look at that beneath a little heart. Look at those two. Aren't they a lovely pair? Congratulations, you worked hard on this. Now you have a finished project. Admire it. And then make another. Bye guys.